Hello, it's me, Osama Bin Laden. I'd like to welcome you to another Rahalaster Purr. Yes, that's right. I am in America. Hooray, and this is all they have to drink here. This is their only soft drink. Everyone has to have this. It's called Seal You Later. Uh, there's a joke on it. It says, knock, knock, who's there? America. And then they kill Osama Bin Laden. And that's all they drink here now in America. It's kind of slightly sad. Uh, so uh, welcome to another show. I mentioned this because um, we're doing another series of As It Occurs To Me. And you know what? I think that bottle of whatever that pop is is going to feature somewhat in this show. Uh, if you would like to come and help us out and see it recorded, the first recording is on the 11th of September at the Leicester Square Theatre. Go to leicestersquaretheatre.com to buy tickets. The more people who come to see it, the more stuff we'll be able to film. It's as simple as that. Uh, so do come along if you can. Uh, we're going to release all of the shows together in 2017 at some point. So it'll be your chance to be the first to see some of the stuff we're doing long before the other idiots who can't come to the show. Anyway, hope you enjoy this. Rahalastapa. With Graham Linehan, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who is currently wondering how old his dental floss is. It's Richard Herring! Hello! Hello! Welcome! Welcome to Richard Herring's Better Square Theatre podcast. Uh, I was on the set of Tron uh, the, uh, this week. Don't you remember the film Tron? I, I was on the set of it. Still open and everything. They, they were just waiting to see if they get another one. Uh, and all the men who were driving, they still drive around on those little motorcycles. And the, the men on that call it Rehearsed, but I don't, I, don't I, don't I don't know if that's going to catch on because they're quite cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I suddenly realised, I've started, you know, like you go to the dentist, I went to the dentist last week, and um, every time they go to the dentist, they go, You've got to floss your teeth. And, you know, I go, And every time I go, Yeah, I'll do that. And then I now do it for one day, and then I never do it. But you buy some new dental floss every time, and then you know I've realised I've got about ten packs of dental floss in my in my bathroom cupboard. So I sort of took one of them out rather than buying one, and I started been using it quite. I've done quite, done quite well. I've done about a week of dental flossing. But looking at the dental floss, you know I don't know what you call it, canister. I don't know what it is, a little tub <laughs> thing. Uh, it's all kind of perished, and uh, you can't really. And I kind of think it might be the first one I ever bought of dental floss. <laughs> I remember getting some from my house uh, when I left home in Cheddar when I was 18. <laughs> I think it's the same one. So I'm, I'm currently using 30-year-old dental floss. And I don't know if that's dangerous, I don't know if it, de it degrades, or whether they used uh, you know, asbestos in it in those days. <laughs> and because I got it from home, I'm wondering, you know, that might was my dad's dental floss, really. What if he was one that he'd had from 30 years before that he bought? I'm thinking, I'll do that every week. So that's kind of weird to think I might be using Ancient. I mean, it's probably worth money, isn't it? That's the thing. I'm just every time, every time I take off a bit of dental floss, that is throwing thousands of pounds to the antique dental floss. This uh, observational material is not going down as well. It's harder than it looks, isn't it? The old man draw stuff. I think it'd be easy. I thought everyone would go, yeah, I identify with that rich. They're not using dental floss and having old dental floss in the house. Everyone else is going, no, we floss regularly and uh, get through a pack of dental floss in probably a month and then move on to the next. Interdental brushes, it's the way to go. Uh, we, we're still here in the past, reeling from uh, the people who are listening and watching this are in the future. Uh, God knows who your Prime Minister is now, but... Uh, <laughs> whether they're from Earth or not. Uh, they're moving, the, the news is moving very quickly, making this uh, a not very topical podcast. Uh, immediately out of date. Uh, but my wife's still very upset about Brexit. and uh, she was, I was actually working late at night, like Graham Linnan would. And uh, I... Uh, I was upstairs and my wife was, was trying to get some sleep and she texted me saying, I can't sleep, I'm so, so angry still about Brexit, I can't sleep. So I, I texted her back and said, lay back and don't think about England. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> which I thought was, that was kind of quite witty after, you know, that's, that could be in a dictionary of quotations, that very topical one. It's not often I'm very witty, I come up with about a joke about every two years, I would say. <laughs> as I've discovered going back over my show for I'm doing a best-of show uh, <laughs> this tour, I realise how few jokes I write. Anyway, let's crack straight on. Um, uh, I was going to talk about uh, Andrea Thingy, Adrian Ledson, 
saying she's being a mother, she understood how things were, but you know, that's fucked already. You know, that's, that, that's fucked from where I wrote that down. That's already not. I wrote that down today, and that's not topical anymore. So imagine how people in the going, well, who's Andrea Ledson? People in the home, what's going on? Who's that? They're like, lizards are in charge now. So, so uh, my guest uh, this week, he is probably best known as Gendarme One in Paris. <laughs> People are so, we're just thinking and remembering that. Isn't you remember the sitcom Paris with the Lexi sale? It's Graham Linnan, ladies and gentlemen. It's Graham Linnan, hopefully. Here he is. No, oh, come on, there he is. Graham Linnan, he's his coat. Welcome. Sit down, pull up a microphone. It's going to be all kinds of fun. So, um, I just said welcome back. <laughs> welcome back because to... Because it was on automatic. <laughs> and uh, well, good, you Enjoy your meal, you too. <laughs> so do you remember being the gendarme one in Paris? Oh, I do, I do, yeah, I do. I do. Was it? Did people well, still stop you in the street? It saying? was kind of like, oh, this is cute. Let's, let's put them in it. And, uh, <laughs> and we came in and we mumbled our lines and, <laughs> and walked off. But it was, uh, it was in the days before we realised you can't just write something and hand it in. Right. You have to be there all the time and you have to be um, anal <laughs> about everything. <laughs> And so you end up reading out lines that don't really work uh, and not really understanding why, because they were funny when you, when you originally thought of them. Yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, just part of the whole Paris experience. Because <laughs> yeah. Paris was uh, Alexi Sales that come... That was it, you wrote that before Father Ted with yeah. Art Matthews, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. It was about an artist in the 1920s. Um, you know, it was just loads of, it was kind of Blackadder, I guess, influenced yeah. a little bit. It was historical jokes, jokes about cubism or, actually, was it cubism? Was that? It was, it was, it was all that sort of thing. And, uh, Alexi, um, you know, our pro uh, the thing we did with Alexi was that we wrote a part that was too, you know, that, that, that kind of worked, worked too much with his, um, uh, his reputation, you know, so it yeah. was very shouty. And uh, it didn't work in the end. It was just people shouting at each other. Yeah. You know. And also, we, o we overwrote by about 10 minutes each show. Right. And they would say, you need to cut it down. And we'd, and, and we'd be like, oh, no, we don't. You know, because we were at that stage where you think, we're not going to change anything. <laughs> and then uh, it would go out, and it would be like 10 minutes too long. And they'd say, well, you're going to have to lose 10 minutes in the edit. And we're like, well, what did we lose? So essentially, we lost all the jokes. Right. Because, because the only thing, you, you had to keep in the plot. Yes. So it was loads of people telling each other what was going to happen next. And, <laughs> and no jokes. <laughs> there were jokes, but they were confusing and weird because we'd lost lots of the context. So it was, uh, yeah, well, it didn't go well. It's interesting. So that's, the, that's your first, I mean, you'd written sketches and stuff for people like yeah. Alexi and Smith and Jones. Mm -hmm. And this was your first. Yeah. Step into sitcom, and then that could, you know, it yeah, well, that could have been the end, though, couldn't it? Oh, God, yeah, we were so lucky. And it was also Channel 4, you know, because yeah. Ch and Channel 4, thank God, um, weren't frightened by the, the lack of success. And they just commissioned Father Ted while it was still going out. Yeah. So, really did they say, show. as long as it's not that Paris thing, you can do yeah. anything you want? <laughs> and we were just, we, we just were, we, uh, from then on, we were just on it, you know, we, yeah. we cast it and we, we were there at every rehearsal and, and you know, we, we you know, you, you, you put in the work, you know. Yeah. Do you think that's something that broadcasters aren't as prepared to do now, to give second chances, or do you think they still do give second? I mean, it's... It depends who they are. I think, I think there's uh, some people who are very frightened of failure, uh, especially in comedy. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people who don't understand comedy and, and kind of hate it uh, because they don't understand it. There's, there's a great story. Jeffrey Perkins, the late Jeffrey Perkins, yeah. who, produced, uh, who produced Father Ted, he was, really, he was really wonderful. And he was once the head of comedy at BBC. And he said that once he got a memo that, that that was some sort of publicity thing for the BBC, and it said, from the greatest costume dramas all the way down to sitcoms. <laughs> you know, and he, and he said he once went into a meeting and everybody was discussing how they did. And, you know, they were talking about their viewing figures of whatever it would be at the time. They were big compared to now. Yeah. But you'd be at 10 million, 11 million. And then he sat down and, and talked, well, uh, you know, only fools and horses. We got um, 24 million. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, and he just talked a little bit about that. And then they listened to it and they went, 
Okay. Uh, and they just went on to something else. Like, yeah. it was just no big thing, you know? And, and he just, he just, I think he really was unhappy there, you know? I don't know if it's changed, but uh, Shane is in there now, and he's lovely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's lo lots of nice, peop nice people there, but I think the, the system is a little odd now. You don't, you used to bring things to a commissioner, and they would put it on the TV. Now you bring it to a commissioner, and they work with you to prepare it to send to some someone who's higher than them, who yeah. doesn't, who's kind of, you know, not really personally involved. Yeah. You know, which is possibly good. I don't know. I don't know if it's leading to better comedy necessarily or no. better programs necessarily. It's difficult. It's a, it weird thing. it's a weird. It's a weird. Because when we were, we were both started around about the same time, and yes. writing something about the same time, and well, it we're was, nearly exactly the same. Yeah, age. and then uh, and then it was really like. You know, just yeah. Here you go. Have a go. <laughs> this is your money. Go off. Yeah, and bring yeah. something back. So it's yeah. And I and I feel that in the past has created lots of amazing. Com you know, that's how Monty Python was created. And, you know, it sort of seems weird that everything's done a bit by committee now, and it's a, you're jumping through hoops. Yeah, yeah. It's really weird. And also, the money is terrible. <laughs> I, 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 I realised recently I would make more money as a failure in America than I am as a success over here. <laughs> and it's tempting. You go, okay, I can go over to America. I could think of it like kind of retirement and go, go over to America and consistently fail and make a great living. <laughs> or I can stay here and consistently do okay and make a terrible living. Yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, we had to move to Norwich, you know, not just because we wanted to get out of London, although that was part of it, but also because, um, you know, we, we couldn't afford a house that was uh, nice enough for, yeah, that was big enough for me to have an office in there and, yeah. and be away from the family. We were all on top of each other. Yeah. And the, the house prices were just getting crazy. And that's another thing about the past. Like, <laughs> there was a time when you could come to London, I don't know what, how you guys are finding it, um, but you could come to London and live quite cheaply somewhere and, you know, we were writing sketches and we were writing stuff for radio. We were getting no money, you know, yeah. just little dribs and drabs of money. But we were able to survive, you know. Mm -hmm. I would sell records because I was a music journalist as well. Yeah. And all these little things kind of carried us through. And I don't know if that would be possible now. No, I, d I can't imagine it is, you know. It was, it was, it's it not is. to sell. You can't sell MP3s. No. You know, so. You've got to give everything away. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. You work hard on something and then it's all... <laughs> well, when I say work hard in it, you know, I've <laughs> written down some stuff in this book this afternoon. Uh, so uh, <laughs> then I just come and chat with people. It's good. So uh, you, uh, you know what? That's when I, I promised Richard I wouldn't talk about anything that I would ask to get cut out. But <laughs> me complaining about money is probably going to be on the back burner. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think people. Oh, I think I'll listen to. Graham Lenehan complained about how little money he's making. <laughs> what a relaxing way to spend the afternoon. <laughs> it's in. Uh, so uh, you, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll listen to her a little bit. Uh, the, you, uh, you grew up in du just outside of Dublin, on the, on the outskirts of no, Dublin? in Dublin. Dublin, yeah. Mm. Did Not you in have the city. I wasn't running yeah. around in rags and, and <laughs> you know, nailing horses to walls. No. <laughs> Did you ever visit... That's, that's what they do. That's what they do. They get bored with a horse, they nail it to a wall. That was a big, uh, big phase in Dublin for a while. It, was, it didn't end up in the commitments for some reason. Did you spend much time in the Chester BT Library in Dublin? In the what? I can't read my own writing, so it might be called something else. The Chester VT BT Library. BT Library, Chester BT Library. No, I don't no. know what that is. Did you ever go to the National Leprechaun Museum in Dublin? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so disappointing, that place. <laughs> uh, the real leprechaun. There's just there. one. Yeah. <laughs> and it's dead and pinned it's up. Dead. He's, <laughs> he's decomposing. The body isn't, you know, it's really, it's actually unpleasant. Did you ever go to the National Wax Museum Plus in uh, Dublin? Is there one? Which it sounds more interesting. I thought, oh, that's good. It's a museum of wax, like it's going to be the history of wax. <laughs> but it's like celebrities made out of wax. Right. Like it's Madame Two Swords, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The, no, that's know, kind Irish. of what I assumed it yeah. was when you described I, I, it. I was, like, I was excited. Oh, what's a, a wax museum? I was, so. I was handles. <laughs> I was booking tickets to go to Dublin to see it until I found out it was just people. <laughs> Are you mad? I love museums. It's so bad in London. What do you think it's going to be like in Dublin? It's going to be amazing. It'd be great. It's going to not look like anyone. I'd like to see 
lots of celebrities that I don't really know who they are my depicted fav- in wax. My favourite thing, one of the things that used to obsess me and Arthur, we wrote sketch- a few sketches about them, was, was uh, lookalikes. I'm sure you love it as well. Yeah, of course. Like lookalikes, like, you know, uh, they'll have, um, you know, some guy who looks a bit like, yeah. uh, you know, Ray Winston, Winston, Winston or something. And then, and then they'll have a guy and they'll say, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> And it's this guy with a deerstalker hat, and he's with a guy who's got a moustache and a bowler hat, and you're like, that's just the spit of him. How did you do that? But then all the rest are like, you would never know if their names weren't on, on them, who they were supposed to be. And it's really, you can have hours of fun looking at a lookalikes website. I really recommend it. Well, we used to look at the, the stage, the back of the stage used to have loads of adverts for lookalikes. Yeah. And so that was the, 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 oh, the newspaper. So, so we, funny. We when to... we first came to London, we kind of wanted to, we lived in that. It was me, Stuart Lee, and a couple of other people lived in this house in Acton together, when you could afford to, at £60 a week, I think. Uh, and uh, each and uh, it was uh, we kept we were obsessed with that but then we became we, we tried to, we were going to start up our own lookalike agency <laughs> I looked a bit like Michael J Fox mm. one of our friends a bit, bit like Elton John right Stu looks like quite a lot of people so he was quite good for it okay but then we were going to go uh, Elton John and Michael J Fox only available together <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if yeah, you're yeah. looking for Michael J. Fox and Elton John yeah, yeah, to yeah. come to your party together yeah, yeah, yeah. and not interact in any way or have yeah. anything worked out. <laughs> but it yeah. was, yeah, we used to love that. That was, lots that was of some very funny wow. stuff out there. Happy day. Those agencies are just gold. We used to, if we found, ever found a good one, we would um, try and put them in a sketch. Like there was a guy in Dublin who looked, exa- and I'm not exaggerating, he looked exactly like Harvey Keitel. He looked the spit of him, and to such an extent that me and Arthur, when we saw him in a pub, we would just drink and stare at him. <laughs> and, and, you know, just not, and then one day I kind of made some, I, I pretended I, I, I was, he was in the way or something, so he'd talk to me so I could hear what he, what he said. And he was, he was like this really hardcore Dublin accent. <laughs> and it was simultaneously you know, disappointing, but also great. So we wrote this sketch where there was these two people having dinner, you know? And uh, they're just talking to each other, you know, and then, uh, and then uh, we, we were going to ask this guy, we were going to fly him over and get him in this one sketch. And the waiter brings him over and he goes, you're Harvey Keitel, sir. <laughs> and they go, thank you very much. And they leave him at the table and he sits down. And then he goes, so how's life? And he goes, ah, you know, it's fucking fine, you know. <laughs> and, and they go, waiter, this Harvey Keitel is Irish. <laughs> Isn't that a great sketch? <laughs> Bring me a proper Harvey Keitel. <laughs> I don't think we talked about this last time, but it reminds me of the, um, uh, you know, the, the Father Ted Experience guys who are, the, uh, who, yes. are who are, well, they're doing the, uh, John Cleese has found out about the, John, the Faulty Towers one now. Yeah, they always... got cross about it. Yeah, yeah. But there, there's people who go around pretending to be the Father Ted characters. They wait until you've, you've kind of forgotten about it, and yeah. then they kind of sneak one on. Right. You know, and then you kind of go, oh, could you not do that? And they go, oh, sorry, we've, we've already booked the place. You know, you, get, you sometimes get letters that go, oh, please don't, please let us down. We've, you know, we've, we've lost all this. And it's like, just don't do it. Don't keep doing it. It's not like, you know, and, and the thing is, it's would be fine if they did it for charity or 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 even you know um uh uh what's the other thing that would be fine if they did <laughs> for you it gave you some money gave me some money yeah, yeah. yeah that you would haven't be got good. that much that's what i've heard <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but you know it just kind of is kind of like well you know people might see that and think it's something to do with us mm. and it's nothing to do with us it's well you absolutely assume it does because it's people Using the characters, using the characters' names, and using sort of incidents. Someone from... saying, "Go on, go on, go on." Yeah, go yeah. On, so know? using the catchphrases. I mean, it's yeah. kind of insane that that can happen. On the last podcast, I couldn't believe that the, the IT crowd had gone to America without your permission. And yeah, they, you've got a very kind bad agent. You've got a very bad agent. It kind of happened just, again. Yeah, it kind of happened again. I did it. What happened? What well, we went over, tried to uh, wrote, came up. I, I've always had this kind of a view of the American IT crowd. I don't think it's worth taking the IT crowd, going over to the States and trying to make the same show. No. Because I think it will, first of all, there's no history of surreal sitcoms in America. Uh, there is, but they're all uh, single camera. They're not multi-camera. The only surreal sitcoms I can remember, you might be able to remember more, are Soap yeah. and um, Married with Children. Okay, yeah. Those, and Married with Children is really broad. You know, so there are the two sitcoms. There's no real the, the the history of American sitcoms is a history of beautiful set design, realistic characters, brilliantly <laughs> deep characters. Yeah. You know, you look at Cheers, and it's just it's just wonderful. It's so deep and rich. And I thought, and Seinfeld, which is you know what the IT crowd was 
badly trying to copy, you know? Um, but my surreal side just kept coming through, you know what I mean? Because that's my default zone, yeah. mode. So I thought, well, let's try and make the, the show that I kind of had in my mind when I started, um, because I always thought it'd be more like Seinfeld, it'd be more realistic and stuff. And so yeah. we'll make that. We'll bring them up from the basement so that, so that uh, rather than this upstairs, downstairs idea, the beautiful people are all around them, you know? Right, yeah. and, I said, and we'll have a few more characters. We'll have some, uh, you know, beautiful, handsome guy and a beautiful woman who are really annoying. And, and, and they'll provide conflict and they'll provide storylines, which were al always really hard to get going in the IT crowd because people had to go down to the fucking basement to, <laughs> yeah. to say, hey, I've just come here casually to start a story. <laughs> but like, you know, <laughs> if, if, if it's upstairs, you have more of a flow and, yeah, it'll, yeah. and it'll be a different show, it'll be an interesting show. And then I thought, well, how about this? How about we make it not just about the IT crowd, but every um, person who's not considered uh, um, worthwhile by the other people in the office, you know, yeah. like couriers and, you know, people who, who are kind of overlooked, you know, and that'll, that'll be what it's about. Yeah. So I sat there, went there for a week, I worked with these two writers, we, we got bullet points, every single beat of this story, right, every single beat, completely different storyline, completely new characters, Moss and Roy and a dumb boss, and Jen, uh, someone who doesn't know anything about computers, who comes into that world, that was all fine, you know? Yeah. But everything else was done specifically to fine tune it so it would work in an American setting, right? Yeah. So I do that, week's work, go home. Wasn't paid. <laughs> <laughs> go home. About a month later, get a call. Oh, we're just gonna shoot your, your original script. We're gonna do the pilot. <laughs> I was like, what? And, and, and also we're doing it for Fox. I was like, fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, the thing about Murdoch is, you know, if I can avoid it, I will. And, to, and the idea that, that it's a done deal, I yeah. went, no, it's fucking, it ruined my last Christmas. I was, I was so angry all the time, yeah. you know. And they literally were just going to do exactly the same thing that the first pilot did <laughs> and copy it shot for shot with new actors. Wow. You know? It's like, what, what do you have to do? You know? <laughs> Show them the first one. And just say, look, it, we've done this. It didn't, yeah, it didn't yeah, work. It exists. <laughs> it might not. It might work this time. Yeah. You yeah. never know. They don't. They're very clever out there in America. They know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, I'll do this quickly. There isn't the, the uh, There's a website called uh, Dirty Britcom Confessions, in which. Um, okay. Yeah, in which comedy fans uh, reveal their sexual fantasies about comedy personages. Mainly British comedians. Okay. But there is an international se section. Right. In which you feature because you are Irish. <laughs> but so there, are, there aren't, they aren't that good. But there's one, this, this, often these are quite dirty and weird. Uh, okay. yours, yours are all about how nice and cute you are. Oh, right? And how nice. they'd like to kiss you and stuff. So this is, oh. the, this is the best one. I wonder how you'd feel about this. Graham Linhan is such an adorable goofball. <laughs> that's yeah. me. Is that a good start? Is that a good start? That's You're such I, a goofball. That's how I describe myself yeah. to people. Uh, I just want to kiss him all over while he tells me funny stories. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that could work? I don't think I'm, it would you work. Know, it's it just I can work. try it now. Yeah. I can try and kiss you all over, and you see how funny your stories are, and how if you can keep your train of thought. So I went to America, <laughs> and then I met the writers. <laughs> Well, that's it. So if, you, if you're up for that, that is... Uh, that's, but um, uh, we're working on that's a lot really, of... That's a really tame sex story. It is. Story, well, it really it? is compared I to... I thought you were going to go somewhere far more, I don't know, oblique and I would have liked to, but I can only work with what the public <laughs> give me on that one. So believe me, there have been... Uh, David Mitchell licking mayonnaise off of my entire body <laughs> is, uh, was my favourite one. It still brings back uh, lots of memories. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, you're working on lots of things all the time, so it's difficult to keep up with you and which ones are going to happen and which ones aren't. So I didn't know about the, the IT crowd again. You're working with Sharon Horgan on, uh, and, your, and your wife, I think. Yeah, on a, yeah, on a show about called Motherland. Motherland. Which is about uh, new mums, I guess. Okay. Or mums who are, I don't know, the kids are toddlers. Yeah. We wanted to do something where the kids weren't important. 
Yeah. So we had the idea that we every time you heard the kids, it would be like the teacher and Charlie Brown, <laughs> right? You know, and so they would just be a noise, or you'd just see the tops of their heads. Yeah. And of course, then when we got there, it's really hard to do. <laughs> so you know, they're in some shots. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's ostensibly about motherhood. I was telling Richard the, uh, earlier one of the true stories that we that the thing we want to do is try and use things that have actually happened, mm. uh, because they seem to be there's something about true stories. I think Seinfeld had a, a rule in, in the Larry David years where they had to be true stories. Yeah. And uh, one of the things we heard was there was this um, nanny who uh, was taking care of a baby. And the mum was driving around town one day and she saw the nanny with the baby begging on a corner. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, whoa. <laughs> that's, that's half an hour. <laughs> Get their double in their income, aren't they? Maybe more than double. Yeah, yeah. It'd be, more, yeah. it'd be better. They're making more money from the yeah, probably. the baby than they're making from the mother. Yeah, maybe their nanny should pay you to take the baby. <laughs> should, if they gave you a cut, it wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. <laughs> they're looking after your kid. They're getting out your hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're earning. It's, they're bringing in the moolah. <laughs> And if you've got, you know, if you've got a nice kid, it's kind of insulting because it's sort of saying that baby is could could look like it's a, a homeless person's baby. Yeah. Do they dirty the baby? I think it's up? a cuteness thing. I yeah, think it's a cuteness thing. That a cute baby. Oh, she looks very well cared for. Then. Uh, so uh, well, let's move into some emergency questions. Um, Already? Yeah, Ready no, go. just because they're fun though. It's just and then because you know we just have to mix it up a bit. Okay. Um, have you ever been in the vicinity of a Bigfoot that, but not seen it? <laughs> But, but sense that it's watching you. No, 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 I haven't, no sorry. Are you can't, sure? I can't think of a funny answer either, no. no. I mean, it's not really an answer. If, you, if it's happened, then that's the answer, so, yeah. uh, William Gibson said a great thing the other day. He said that camera phones uh, made UFOs disappear yeah. and police violence appear. <laughs> Very true. Uh, there's some. There's. I've, lots of people have been nicking my emergency questions, and, and, and it's a shame, though, isn't it? it, it there's a little bit of sadness about that because, you know, in the old days, like uh, even 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 as recently as the seventies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like Steven Spielberg made Close Encounters, which I remember when I was a kid was just the most thrilling thing ever. Mm -hmm. But you could really make a film like that now? Because everyone would just go, well, why isn't it on telly? Why aren't there... Do you know what I mean? Why don't all these people see it on telly? Why isn't it being filmed on camera files? There's so much stuff that's like that. That's like, you can't, you know, there, there was an article online about, you know, something like a hundred Seinfeld stories that you couldn't do now. Yeah, because of, yeah. you just ring each other up and... Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, life was, you know, even in the 1990s, if you went to the pub and you were meant to meet someone and you, they didn't I know. turn up... that was it. That was, yeah, that was the end of the evening. That was it, yeah. Because I go home, you know, and now you it's like, ring oh them no, up. there's 30 <laughs> other people in the area. <laughs> <laughs> you can ring them up, leave a message on their answer phone saying, oh, I, I waited yeah. at the pub, you didn't turn up. Yeah, Give yeah. me a ring tomorrow and let me know what happened. Um, yes, we, we had phones back then. That's uh, a, that, it's another thing, but it's kind of crazy. That, that always used to frustrate me when people used to moan about Twitter and Facebook and social networking. I mean, I know they've all got their problems, you know? I mean, Twitter is actually probably poisonous in a lot of different ways, <laughs> I'm beginning to realise. But the thing that always bugged me was that people weren't interested in admitting that it had completely changed the human race yeah. is like don't you find there's a little kind of bit of wonder in you about the fact that we now are all kind of connected telepathically do you know what I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean aren't you at all interested in that <laughs> and it was all these people about Twitter shit you know <laughs> uh, oh why don't you try it oh the same reason I don't try street mime you know because <laughs> you know I know it's probably shit that's like, wow, okay, so no curiosity about this thing that, that connects every single human being on the planet, yeah. you know? I don't know, it's, 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 although I wonder, you know, you also think, is all the kind of craziness we're going through at the moment, is that because of I sort of feel it's like Twitter's, you know, finally gained sentience and come to life and is a yeah. beast that is destroyed, you know, because I think all the politics, I think it's, it comes from uh, reality TV and Twitter and... and 
you know, and vo I think voting for things like the X Factor mm. has changed the way people's minds work with those things. So people mm. can go on Twitter, Donald Trump can come on and just say the opposite of what the truth is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can defend himself saying, I'm the one standing up, for, you know, he's been accused of r raping a child, mm. but he's going on about Hillary Clinton's yeah, uh, emails yeah, yeah. all the time. No one's but, going, well, you know, we're going to just go on things that are but accusations, actually, Donald, maybe we can But I don't blame I don't blame Twitter and things for that. I blame, I blame you know, the, media, the, the, the mainstream media, which yeah. it's like, it's like there's two groups of people now. There's people who are plugged in and know that stuff is happening, yeah. bad stuff is happening. And then there's people who are getting their news and information from the usual sources yeah. and they don't know that it's happening. And, and as a result, you get, you get matters of fact treated like matters of opinion, yeah. you know? So you'll have someone, well, this guy, this guy, here's Donald Trump, right? And Donald Trump is saying, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, killed the Beatles, you know? <laughs> and then what do you say to that? It's like, no, 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 no. It's not an argument. She yeah. didn't kill the Beatles. <laughs> you just say, that's a lie. Yeah. That's a big lie. You're lying. You know? And it's like, you do that to everyone. They didn't do it on Brexit either, yeah. you know? No, no, You're fucking lying. Your dad didn't lose his business <laughs> gold. You big cunt. Yeah. <laughs> but it works, and it works the other way. It works the other way around. It works the other way around. I'm not so, proud of getting a round of applause in <laughs> the word cunt. Sorry. I think it works the other way around in that, um, you know, that, that people... Oh, what was I going to say? I've, I've, I had a great, great argument there. I lost my train of thought. It's uh, uh, lies. Um, well, no, it works the other way. You know, that people... That conspiracy theories are now just... Accept, so, like, you know, I think when the... At the moment, what we're experiencing is, is the Corbyn versus the rest of the Labour Party. And it just becomes this kind of conspiracy thing. So you're on one side of that and you think... Well, and everyone just goes, oh, that's a conspiracy, or yeah. all Labour MPs are Blairites, yeah. apart from Corbyn, and, you know, or anything that's in fact a conspiracy the BBC, theory becomes accepted as, as real. Everyone, everyone thinks the BBC is biased, mm -hmm. every single fucking political group thinks the BBC is biased, yeah. and it's like, they're not biased, they, <laughs> they, it's just because they're not pointing out facts, and as a result, you think they're biased. Yeah. But if you point out facts, if you say, like someone said, right-wing right news <laughs> is basically fan fiction. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's presenting a view of the world that just does not exist, okay? Whereas news, as it should be, is just facts, yeah. you know? And the thing that really annoys right-wingers is, is that facts are left-wing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not the first person to say that. Facts are left-wing. Do you know what I mean? If you increase yeah. the amount of... Um, of uh, information about uh, sex uh, to kids, if you increase the availability of contraception, if you do all this sort of stuff, you will bring down levels of abortion, right? But they don't want to do that because they're more interested in making people, you know, feel bad about themselves. And, and, and as a result, you know, the, the stuff that's been proven is just being ignored, like dr same with drug, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Legislation, you know, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. It's you know, some countries and they're doing it and it, and it's working. But yeah. that will never happen in England because it's more important to, 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 to have the appearance of hating these things and, yeah. and just thinking they're, you know, it's it's just binary. Uh, but it also, sorry, I'm boring myself. It's, no, it, it's, it's it's interesting. I think it but it creates. I mean, I think it it validates you whatever you think. The internet, it's you know, whoever you are, whatever you think. Whatever perversity you have, it suddenly validates you because you realise there are other people out there like you. So I think the rise of UKIP and the rise of that yeah. and the Brexit thing comes from people going, oh, you know, I, you know, and maybe that's good or bad, whichever way you look at it. But there's mm. people coming together via that, and then I think that that's where it becomes where where that turns into reality and awful things happen, where someone goes, you know, mm. when awful crimes are committed as a result of people being emboldened by yeah. by other people agreeing with them online. So it creates those echo chambers, which I don't think is very helpful. That's, that's, the, that's the problem. That you, don't, you don't hear the other side. And if you try to, you know, today I had an, an argument, and I'm, I don't really know what I think about the Labour Party, but I'm kind of interested in debating it. But if you try and talk to anyone about it, it's just very much like, no, if the, <laughs> I'm all for Corbyn, and it's everyone else is against Corbyn, and Corbyn yeah, is great, yeah. and everything else is evil. There's no, like... Is there any suggestion that There's, it might be bad for the Labour Party? No, it's not. You know, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. so you get into those things, and then and then you just get frustrated talking to each other because you're not going to change each other's minds. Yeah, yeah, it's not the right place for, no. for these things. But I think that that I think that the, a lot of 
you know, I would imagine a lot of newspapers, journalists uh, uh, and broadcast journalists are depressed because they think they're being usurped by all this technology, whereas in fact they're more important than ever because they can present, the, they can dive down into the facts and they can present the facts to people. Yeah. Like there's a thing on BBC, they have a BBC reality check and it's a, it's a, it's a Twitter feed, you know, and, and, and I was thinking, only politics nerds will, will follow this feed. Yeah. It shouldn't be on a feed. It should be on the news. We are, this is what happened. This is what he said. This is the truth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sorry. Well, I mean, I mean, it's incredible. The whole Brexit thing is incredible. The number of lies. But, you know, actually, I had an argument with someone saying, well, there were lies on both sides. And I said, well, what are the lies from the, uh, mm. from the Remain side? Yeah. And he said, well, David Cameron said there would be World War Three if... Uh, <laughs> if we if we leave, I said. Well, what time is that? <laughs> I said, and, he, and he was going. It hasn't happened yet. That was his, That's what I was saying. Like things already seem to be going quite bad economically. It would suggest that this was, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. They, those economic experts were correct. But yeah. you know, I'm prepared to give it some time and see what happens. But and then, but then someone else came in and said, well, actually, what you know, I think David Cameron made a comment about national security. That I think he said that. Europe is safer uh, from world war as a result of yeah. being together, which is obviously true. Yeah. And then the, the, the exit people said, David Cameron's saying that there'll be World War Three. If so, the, the guy who was quoting me this fact after I said to him, just come back with one fact. He said, one, yeah. one, 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 one lie. Yeah, 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 it took yeah. him ages. He said, I don't, I'm not going to trawl the internet for the time. <laughs> I'm asking you to trawl the internet, just find one. Line. And then he said, oh, they came back with this. And I said, can you tell me what speech is? I'm not going to go and trawl the internet to find out what speech the thing I've just made up has come from. <laughs> but it turned out it was a lie from the, right, from right. the exit people anyway. So it's, when but, you're dealing with but stuff But it was like Cameron. That, yeah, it well, was Cameron, Cameron, so it's slightly different. Well, I mean, uh, I can't get Yeah, but he hadn't actually said it. So, he, you know, he, right. hadn't, he hadn't actually lied. Oh, it was he's a lie that he said it? It was a lie that the, the exit people had said that he had, had talked it up into a lie and he hadn't ever said anything like that. Right, it. right, right. He basically well, said it would be more peaceful if we Again, in. all you need is a reality, a kind of reality yeah. check. You know, this is, he said this, this is true. Like, Trump is just amazing. I mean, Trump, Trump the, the lies that he's, he's broken through so many barriers of, of discourse, of yeah. political discourse, that, that it's, like, it's almost like a bull has run through a stable and created this huge hole through each part of it. And you're just looking down. Oh, look, you could just walk up there now. And, and that's what it's going to be like for all these politicians in the future. They're just going to be able to lie, and then they know that the BBC will go, uh, or whatever the yeah. channel is, because the balance thing is everywhere. RTE had to recently apologize uh, for something I did with my wife, because we went over to speak about our experience of fatal fetal abnormality. We had our first uh, pregnancy. We, 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 it didn't happen, you know? Yeah. And, and luckily, we were in the UK, and the, the NHS you know, told us what to do about it. You can't get that in Ireland, you know? And so we, we talked about it on this show, and RT had to apologize because there wasn't an opposing view telling us that my wife should have uh, brought the child, born the child for nine months and then watched it die as soon as it was born. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like balance as a concept has become completely used by the right wing to uh, poison uh, the national conversation. Yes. No, I think it has. And, but also because it makes good TV, but also because you sort of think you're getting a balance. You'll take someone, even if you have a balanced thing, it'll be someone from UKIP, it'll be someone from the left of Labour and maybe one person from the middle. Yeah. But if the truth is most people are somewhere in the middle. Most yeah, people absolutely. Say, you know, let, I'm just making up, but say 70% are in the middle and, and there's 15% and either side. If every debate you have a UKIP person and a, a left-wing person, that's massively yeah. uh, misrepresenting that view and then therefore, you know, the people yeah. in the middle, who's most people who I think would like to... You know, that's what I sort of feel with all of this. Most people, even if they voted... <laughs> whichever way they vote in the, in the leave and uh, remain thing, would like to, some way of sorting out so everyone's happy. Well, this is, this is, this is what, this is what uh, I don't know whether it is, uh, I don't think a second referendum is in any way realistic. It, uh, I've been following it a little bit, and it, it seems that it's not. But the thing that really annoys me about the referendum is that it wasn't fought on facts. And as a result, no one really knew what was going to happen. And, and, and you can see this, like, I, I never saw a single piece, uh, uh, article, about what would, I mean, I'm sure there were some, but they should have been much more uh, spread about. Like, what would happen to Northern Ireland when yeah, yeah. we left the EU? Because the border's going to go back up, and you're going to have soldiers searching people as they go across the border. 
the same way that you used to. You're going to have a lot of pissed off people in the north who want to be part of Ireland, and there's no more free movement. You're going to have a lot of p pissed off people in the south for the same reason, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's crazy that I only saw an article about this <laughs> after the fucking vote went through. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about it. I'm Irish and I hadn't even thought about it. <laughs> well, they really got the debate going after it had happened. <laughs> they, really they, really, they really started putting everything It kicked up a notch. <laughs> it did. And everyone went, oh, God, it would be quite bad if we left. <laughs> 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 if exactly, they give yeah. another chance, let's not vote for that again. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it, I'm, but also, everyone voted for different things. So lots of people vote. Some people were voting because they want sovereignty, whatever that means, and they believe that we don't have that. Uh, some people were voting because they thought that the immigrants were going to leave. I think they thought leave meant that immigrants yeah. leave. Yeah. And yeah. That gen that's generally definitely the case. Well, at least for some they, people. they had those trucks so, that said go home. Yeah, yeah. Theresa May had trucks around that said yeah. go home. So. Uh, posters that say leave may well be part of that same campaign. Yeah. You know? So, you know, but so none of these people are going to get exactly what fuckers. they want anyway. So now there should be a referendum saying, what were you expecting from the, <laughs> from the leave? <laughs> Let's have a vote about that. But, you know, the, no one's actually going to get what they want, you know, I, I think, from it. So it's, it's a real, I mean, it's such a disaster. Whichever I, side you're on, it's just awful. It's interesting that Theresa May has placed herself apparently today. She said, we've, we've said we're leaving. Let's make it work. And I kind of think that that might be an opportunity because, because you need a, I think you need a, a centrist party who says, fuck you, no, we're going to represent all the people who voted to stay yeah. and the people who wish they'd voted to stay. Yeah. You know? And it would be good if that could be set up in time, but you know. <laughs> that's I know, true. That's not, but but <laughs> it, as you see within the Labour Party that can't even agree between itself what it yeah. thinks the Labour Party is. Yeah, so yeah. that's a starting point. I joined it? Labour because of Corbyn uh, thinking, oh, this is great. And, but now I'm, I'm beginning to get a bit, well, very nervous with it because, I don't know, they seem to be fighting battles of the 70s and 80s rather than fighting what's going on now. And people say, well, you know, he's got a Snapchat account. And I don't think that makes... I think he's... <laughs> I think he's but I think the whole country's, you know, we've done a good night's sweetheart on our country. <laughs> but we said you know, only Gary Sparrow is staying in the, in the present and everyone why else is, has why gone. Why are you obsessed with good I just am obsessed with good <laughs> I, love, I love just, I love sort of time travel stuff, but when, especially, oh, okay. when, especially when it's wrong, though, you know. So, that's, so I, I, I'm infuriated by it. Right. Uh, yeah. And want it to be properly done. Yeah, yeah. I, and I like Good Night Sweetheart. A, because I think it's a missed opportunity, because I think it's really interesting where they, if you could travel back in time uh, and know you're, you could have an affair with someone and know you would never be caught, would you feel guilty or would you, would you still feel guilty Does about it? Does your wife listen to the podcast? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I know I wouldn't want to do it, but, it, but he's not conflicted in the... In that the my problem is I go back in time <laughs> and I would have the affair and then I come back and I tell my wife yeah. about it. Because I'd be crying, I'm so sorry. Well, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. He doesn't conflict it. He isn't upset about it particularly. Yeah. He isn't like a great. He, he, you know. So I think that's, there's a real interesting psychological thing in, in whether a human being, if they knew they couldn't get caught, would they still feel guilty? And it would depend on the person. I, I have a weird. I have a weird recurring dream. Yeah. Where um, the the it's not it's not the same dream, but but I have the same history in the dream. Right. And the history in the dream is that I have had an affair. Right. So I'm I'm in this dream and I'm going okay I've had an affair so. I, oh, I haven't told Helen about it. Why haven't I told Helen and stuff? And, and then I wake up and the new reality is like, oh, no, I haven't. I have to kind of talk. Have I had an affair? <laughs> <laughs> no. You know? And, uh, and yeah, but it's a really yeah. weird thing. It's like I've got a history in a dream. It is weird when those... Because like, sometimes I think, is that just... Did I just have a very long dream where it felt like that was... But there were dreams that sort of refer, re refer back to other yeah, dreams. Yeah, to past and so past And things. so you sort of believe in the reality of it. Yeah. Do you remember when you wore the cheese hat? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I once had a dream that, well, as a kid, I'd murdered a small girl. <laughs> and, and buried her in the, in the hills in Cheddar. <laughs> Wow. And I woke up, and I thought, did I, did I do that? I had to really think hard, and then I wonder if I did do it. And, yeah. I've, just, and I've repressed it, apart from in that. I, I mean, I was a kid as well. It wasn't like I was, you know, so it was a kid killing another kid, and then my dad helping me to bury him in, <laughs> in the hills. No, I haven't been caught, have we? This could be, this could yeah. be the moment. I don't remember any little kids go missing. No. It was, it was summer, so you know, people didn't probably know how many kids they are. Papers near where you used to live. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I often have those kind of yeah, weird dreams where you yeah history. Maybe it comes with age. I mean, uh, you're you're 49. I'm I'm, I'm, yeah. fi I'm nearly 50. Right. 
like 50 next year. But, but like, maybe you... I'm 48, actually, Graham. I'm 49 <laughs> tomorrow. Oh, so, so uh, let's, let's... Maybe you develop... Clinging on to Maybe it. you develop a kind of, you know, a, 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 a kind of parallel history in, yeah. in your dreams, you know? Like, maybe, that, maybe that's a persistent thing now for you <laughs> in all the rest of your dreams. Oh, yeah, I'm Richard Herring. I'm a comedian. I killed a kid. <laughs> <laughs> got away with it and I opened my big mouth but it was also in the, this is probably a dream right so as long as this is within I oh know if this is within the dream I'm that's a great caught. moment that doesn't happen a lot but when it does oh sorry did I interrupt you no, no, okay. sorry sometimes I just I'm so tired I just I just bliss out but like uh, uh, that's a brilliant moment in a dream where you are in terrible trouble and then you realise it's a dream yeah. that's the best feeling <laughs> oh god you know like you've killed a kid and yeah. you're like oh I haven't <laughs> Oh, phew! <laughs> I've had dreams that I've realised it's a dream, but then I've not been able to wake up and not being able to escape it. And really? Then, yeah, I've had lucid dreams occasionally. I had one really long dream that I kept waking up, but then I was still asleep. Oh, right. My experience Just of that horrible. was kind of pleasant. I, I've had lucid dreams where I've kind of realised this is a dream. I'll have a look around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll ask you another. This was good, it was good that emergency question worked very well. I can't remember what it was, but whatever. <laughs> I it's interesting that you like. Do you like high concept sitcoms then? I well, I I, I sort of enjoy um, them if they go, if they if they don't work as well. So I kind of so I, like, I watch, as I was saying to you, I watched Zoolander two uh, right. the other day, and it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not even enjoyable, terrible. But as a writer, you watch it and go, I've just finished my second draft of the script that I'm writing, which is about alternate universes, and mm. it's basically Sliding Doors uh, and uh, Goodnight Sweetheart put right. together, <laughs> but done properly, hopefully. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, well, I'll be very furious with myself if it comes out wrong. Uh, but then I watched Zoolander 2 and thought, oh, well, my script is definitely better than this. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. is... There used to be, when we were first writing comedy, we used to see there was a certain programme <laughs> that kept winning BAFTAs. Right. And we used to have what we called the radiator test, which was when I was a kid at... Sorry, story within a story. But when I was a kid at school, there used to be these radiators uh, during the winter, and you used to... Because we were so bored out of our heads. We would sit on these radiators and see how long we could stand it. We used to do the radiator test with this programme, with this BAFTA-winning programme, you know? And we would last... Five minutes, ten minutes, you just could not bear the style of comedy, you know? And it was such a great thing. There was always the shows that you wanted to emulate, but also there were these other shows that were winning BAFTAs. Yeah. And you go, I can do better than that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, it's, it's sort of interesting with the It's Hollywood good to have good stuff and bad stuff. It is. It pushing is. you and pulling you. So, so you know, I think, and, and I think to be able to, if you really sort of analyze, start analysing those things, you start seeing the good in them as well as the bad in them, unless they are really terrible. No, no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> there was the no only good joke there. in Zoolander 2 is, and it's quite, and it takes a long time to pay off, uh, is that... Um, uh, Owen Wilson, who's like just, um, you know, it just looks like he's phoning everything in there. He doesn't yeah, care yeah. about anything. Yeah. Uh, he's, it's a shame because he's a wonderful he is, comic he actor. Is amazing, he's amazing, yeah. But he's in a relationship with an orgy, so he's, he's, he's in a relationship with 11 people. Oh, or that's something. funny. Uh, but then, and then, but then they all job. become pregnant. <laughs> Uh, um, and Keith the Sutherland it's, it's very much let's have a celebrity instead of a joke as I was saying to you right. Keith the Sutherland is one of the orgy people yeah. and, he's, and he has his pregnancy test as well and he's pregnant as well this is not yet to the funny bit <laughs> uh, and so that's it's hilarious because he's Sutherland a man Keith the Sutherland is pregnant with Hansel's child Right. There's a spoiler coming up here. I contend that Zoolander, two writers and directors, have already spoiled this film, so it's <laughs> it's it's okay. But at the end, they are, they get and he falls out with his orgy and he has an affair with another orgy. And it's, you know, it sounds like a brilliant. It sounds good when I'm describing it. Yeah. Uh, and I, it's not a bad idea. But then at the end, Keith Sutherland comes back and they, and the orgy come back and they're all going, I'm, I'm, and he says, I'm ready to my responsibility to look after my kids and keep the something that says, I lost my baby. <laughs> 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 and it's all so inappropriate. <laughs> That's a great guy. Really, That's a really, really funny really guy. He looks really sad. I lost my baby. <laughs> I love but that. He's going, it's okay, then we'll bring up the other Shit. ten. I will, but I, it's just... <laughs> If only they put those two little beats on YouTube and just, you could not have to watch the film. For yeah. But it's sort of, you know, it's amazing when you have see Have you ever seen the Red Letter, red letter Media um, deconstruction of, um, oh, what's it called? Star Wars. 
No, no, not Star Wars. That's the famous one. They yeah, did, they did one of a, they did one of the Adam Sandler drag comedy. Oh, yeah, Jack and Jill. We Jack and Jill, yeah. and that's apparently extraordinary. Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm obsessed with Adam Sandler films. Yeah. In fact, we talked about them in uh, the last podcast, I think, <laughs> uh, including Jack and Jill. But yeah, it's amazing. But, but re- that's amazing. Re- you should watch this review. Yeah, you yeah. love it. I mean, they basically accuse him of fraud. Yeah. Because they yeah. they say these movies cost you know fifty million to make, yeah. and there is like half a million on screen and the rest is shared out amongst all his actor friends yeah, yeah. you know what I mean yeah. and, and there's a brilliant I mean there's a brilliant moment in it where they go in, in a movie like this right the scene you would expect to see would be a scene when both of them are in the same shot <laughs> <laughs> you know and he goes but that doesn't have it. he says maybe that happens once he says but that's just you know they don't it's too it's too hard to do. They, they're too, it's going to be expensive. So every single shot in Jack and Jill is shot of Adam Sandler and then shot of Adam Sandler dressed up talking to Adam Sandler. Because they just couldn't be arsed. They just couldn't be arsed. And Pacino's in it for no reason. Going like this at her and her going back. And I guess they assume the audience is going to think that's the funniest fucking thing yeah. ever. But, but anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm ruining it. Watch the Red Letter Media <laughs> thing. It's brilliant. It's really, really good. But that is, you know, that's, it's almost a sign. It doesn't, I mean, I think maybe, I've heard the Absolutely Fabulous film is very good and that is full of stuff to cameos. But it's almost like I can't think of anything. Yeah, Let's yeah, just yeah. get Susan Boyle walking through. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, it is bad. Like it's hilarious, Susan Boyle's like that for no... And, like, when, and you, when people, and that joke when people go, hello, Susan Boyle, where they say the full name. Yeah. For some reason. <laughs> <like>, okay. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's move on. Anyway, so don't bother renting company. Zoolander 2 if you haven't watched it already. Has anyone watched Zoolander 2? Yeah. Yeah? One man. <laughs> did, you, did you enjoy it? No. No. <laughs> no it, was, it was pretty disappointing, wasn't it? I mean, they didn't have... Even if they'd just done a very run-of-the-mill, like, repeat of the first one, the first one's pretty good. I don't even know. If they I, just, I, even if they no, just... I, I think I'm, I'm, I, as I say, I'm 50 nearly, and I don't really have enough time left to be spending even a second watching a film like Zoolander 2. You know what I mean? I mean, you can smell it. You can yeah. smell how bad it is before it arrives. I'm really surprised you watched it. I didn't. I thought it'd be okay. I like Ben Stiller, and I thought he would. I, th- I thought he would have more self-respect. Yeah, yeah. I just do a quick Google search, see the general tenor of the reviews. <laughs> nope, not for me. Because it's a ter- I, I, it's it's really bad as well. Um, critics uh, praising stuff that's not good. Um, that's also a waste of, that's, that's really bad. But you see films that have been pumped up and they're just terrible. And also films that are being misrepresented. Like um, I used to love a film, uh, Stranger Than Paradise by Jim Jarmusch. Oh, yeah. It's uh, John Lurie and this other guy, uh, who's a brilliant actor who, you, who you, you'd know if you saw him. He's been in a bunch of things. And they're just these two kind of beatnik guys and this, this kind of uh, cousin of theirs from Russia or somewhere comes in. And, and, and it's just really, it's really sweet. It's slow moving, it's long takes, it's black and white, and it's, it's kind of boring, mm-hmm. right? But it's nice, it's a nice film. <laughs> and then we saw on the poster, it said, funniest film of the year. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, you fucking liar. <laughs> and what happens is that you go and you have a bad experience because you were expecting the funniest film of the year. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. I yeah. hate that. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, that had on happiness as well. Happiness. Remember happiness? Yeah. Happiness. Funniest film of the year. <laughs> no, it's funny, but it's not the funniest film of the year. It's really disturbing. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'm going to ask you an emergency question. I've been copying them off other people now because people copy mine. Uh, and so here are some of the ones that I've, been, that I've nicked. And at least I'm crediting who's nicked them. Lifehacks.io. If you could jump into a pool of something, what would it be? Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. Sorry, man. Can you warn me about a couple no, of these? No, I'm not this... I might come not, up with something good. No, it's good when you This can't. isn't going to be as good that as the be- Armando is, one. Believe me, that is better that you did, It's better that you went... <laughs> <laughs> chocolate. That's seeing a great comedy mind at work there. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all part of it. MarshallJonesJr.com. Have you ever tried sushi? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> it's nice. I, I, I only realised how good it was yeah. quite late in life. Oh, and yeah. then I realised, oh, it's the most delicious thing in the world. Mm. It's amazing. Mm. 
Because you think rice and fucking fish. Yeah, raw fish. I'm, you know, it's the, the uh, uh, oh, Dr. Dr. Steve Brule bit where he eats sushi for the first time. <laughs> he just kind of spits it out, <laughs> laughs at the idea of it. I'm not a kitty cat. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Steve Brule is. Are you, anyone fans in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, I, this is I don't know what kind of crowd you are. I can't really this see. This one is a new one I have to ask from last week's podcast. It won't mean much to you, but I still want you to answer it. Okay. Who would you rather die, Windsor Davis or Matthew Crosby's wife? <laughs> Who would I rather die? Died, yeah. Windsor Davis from Never the Twain Shall Meet. Is he still, is he He's still alive, I think. Is he still alive? We had him in Paris. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. There I you was go. so excited. I was so happy about I it. I think he's still alive. He came up last week. I've never ascertained, but let's say he is still alive. <laughs> I think uh, he is. Or Matthew Crosby's wife. Matthew Crosby is a comedian from Pappy's Fun Club. Right. Um, his wife's very a nice young person. She's a very pretty, uh, very talented producer. It's kind of like if 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 you could save a burning, uh, save a child or the works yeah. of Shakespeare from a. <laughs> it's a little house. bit. So really, but, you, you know, you, you know, want, me, you want me to say the man who's lived his his full life and is nearly dead anyway? I don't want you. I want to. No, I'm going to go for the wife. I'm going to okay. go for the wife. I think it's, it's probably it's probably the right choice. <laughs> I felt you manipulating me. I didn't like it. Okay. Um, uh, and this is the one I wrote today. Where do you stand on transubstantiation? I'm against it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> so you sc- do you still script? Do- you used to script Doctor for films and other people. Do you do that sort of stuff? Anymore? No, it's really hard work to get because right. I mean I think you have to. I, I genuinely am thinking of writing a play just so, an original play, just so people will uh, respect me. Because uh, when you're a sitcom writer, you might as well be a fucking birthday clown. You know? As far as, as, far as studios are concerned, you know? Yeah. Oh, this guy, you should try him. He's a bozo. He really walks around, he pops his nose, he's got big feet. He's great. You make him do a uh, third draft and we'll be fine. But, like, uh, but we, I would usually get children's films. I did, right. did I tell you what I did? No. I did uh, Agent Cody Banks 2. Okay. <laughs> and you'll like this. I did a scene where um, all the kids played uh, uh, War, What Is It Good For? And the Queen got down. <laughs> I, I wrote a scene that had that in it because I knew they'd love it. <laughs> I knew that they, they're going to think this is the best thing. <laughs> Whoa, what is it good for? And the Queen knew this. Here's 10 grand. <laughs> I mean, really, it's the easiest job in the world because, the, because I mean, that's one reason why I wanted to do it. Yeah. Because um, American films are genuinely often, you know, if they, if they need a writer to come in at, at a certain stage are often very badly written. Yeah. I mean, you know, some are, some are okay. And also, a lot of the heavy lifting has been done. They've got a story with a beginning, yeah, middle, yeah. and end. You know, yeah. that's fine. But the, 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 the only thing you ever have to do when you do a rewrite is you just have to do the show, don't tell thing. Yeah. You know? I mean, do, do, is, are people familiar with show, don't tell as a concept? Yeah. Right, okay. So oh, that's what you have to do. Someone comes, no? Okay. I quite like not doing it, though. That's a percentage. <laughs> I that's think let's, percent- not t- let's not tell them. Let's, no, no, no. Them. That's a percentage of your audience at home as well. It so is, we've yeah. got to do it. Show don't tell means uh, if I was writing a scene where I got angry with Richard yeah. here, uh, I don't write, I'm very angry with you. Uh, I write, I kick the table, he kicks the table over and smashes Richard in the face. That's showing that I'm angry rather than telling. And that's what every script lacks. It's yeah. full of people telling each other the story. You know? And all you have to do is go in and say, well, how do I turn that into a dramatic you know, moment and yeah. and it's it's just kind of easy because all as I say, all the heavy lifting has been done. Yeah, and it's really lucrative. You get a <laughs> load of money. You don't put your name on it, um, and you know you do quite well. But you know, I, I I only get asked to do children's movies and movies set in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> they asked me to do that one. Um, oh God, they begged me to do it. It was a it was a, a romantic comedy with what. Well, is that the one in Ireland? Yeah, the Amy thingy. Yeah, leap year. They asked me to. They begged me to do leap year, and I saw the trailer and there was a line in it. Is the bloke still in there trying to beg you to do it? Like, it's leap year. Will you do it, Graham? Will you do it? Stays in it out. I don't care. Come back and do it. But there was a line in it, and they were going, and there was the, it was something like, "Wait a second, we're going to have to drive all the way from Wales to Dublin." <laughs> 
you know? And I thought, wow, that's what I would have had to do. That, that's what I would have done on the rewrite. I would have just crossed that out. You're you putting can't that car drive on a from ferry Wales for to quite Dublin. a long time. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I had to start saying no to that type of stuff because it, the only thing I said no to recently, uh, yes to recently, was I just did a tiny, tiny bit of work, like a day on Paddington. Oh, and, right. and, yeah, so. and I have to say, I didn't really realise from the script how charming it would be. I saw the script and I thought, well, this is just going to be one of those... Um, I should have had more faith in Paul, because yeah. Paul's brilliant. He does the mighty boosh and stuff, you know. Um, but uh, it looked like, on paper, it just looked like one of these quick cash-in, pud pudsy the dog type yeah. movies. But it was really beautiful, yeah, was nice, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll put that down to you stepping in and <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. turning around for them. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what else? Did I, no, I really didn't do anything. <laughs> I, kind of, I can't remember what I did. I may have corrected a misspelling. <laughs> oh, you, uh, you, uh, you t t tweeted me to tell you just that you mentioned cryptically your son's text about the bear. Oh, shit, if I turned off my phone. Oh, oh no. I'm going to have to wait we for this to turn We can fill. Yeah, no, I'll do that. Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you about the other thing, yeah. which was my Twitter joke that I couldn't tweet because, A, it's not really my style, so lots of people would thought it, think it was serious, and B, uh, something I'll explain in a sec, but the, the joke was, um, uh, uh, racists, are, racists are in a race, all right. A race to the bottom. <laughs> right? That was my joke. I wanted yeah. to do it with the exclamation mark and everything. And... Uh, <laughs> And then I thought, no, everyone's going to think I'm serious for one day. Because <laughs> I kind of stopped doing j jokes on Twitter. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing I realised was, you know, oh, I, I literally had it and ready to go. And I was thinking about it. Well, should I do this? Should I not? And uh, then I heard that a, a place near us had been firebombed because right. the family were Polish. Yeah. And I kind of thought, oh, OK, I can't really do this joke at the moment because racism is suddenly not funny. Yeah. It's yeah. suddenly not this abstract thing that, that you can... Poke, like the way you and I would often poke a, a thing like that. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you fucking hell, you dressed as Hitler for yeah, years. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can poke this stuff, but would you dress for, as Hitler no, for it, a year now? Funnily enough, I did. I'm doing a best of show. You so might get that. people following you down the street. <laughs> well, I did a best of show. I'm doing a best of show as my next tour. And my, one of my favourite routines is from that Hitler's Last Show, which is about how racists are actually more liberal than liberals because they believe there's only four types of people in the world, whereas liberals believe there's 195 different types of people in the world. Why so they're closer to seeing everyone in the world as being the same. As being the they're 191 oh, okay. closer. Right. But <laughs> they're liberals, and that's what we want. And it's quite a carefully crafted routine. But again, it was A, the first time I'd done it for a long time, so I was still trying to remember it. But B, it sort of starts with me going, you know, I've got this moustache, and I was, I, you know, I was worried maybe the moustache was what made it Hitler racist. Because I'm not a racist, but... Uh, you know, when I had the moustache, I wondered if maybe racists had a point. And usually, you're getting a laugh, and everyone's going, Ooh, where's, he, where's he going with this? And then even so, and then the routine's quite carefully explained, but it uses some of the racist language in it. And it's, you know, it's, I'm very proud of the routine, but it was a very, very different atmosphere doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And it didn't work. At yeah. all, whereas it always worked before and it didn't work. And I think that might just be now. Yeah. And, and, and it, that hopefully it will pass. But yeah, it was. I mean, that whole show, I did then a big bit of saying, oh, that whole show was actually about how we should vote to stop uh, right wing politicians ga gaining prominence. So that fucking worked. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> right, I, uh, think but, I, yeah. I think I have this for you now. This is, uh, this is a verbatim text from my son. I checked it with my wife. I know you always see these things online. Oh, my, my cute son said this. and. It's, it never seems to be true, but um, I checked it with my wife and I do trust her. So <laughs> she swore that this was true. He said, uh, my, his sister, Wendy had a toy panda that she chucked onto the floor. So I picked it up and put it in my bed. I noticed it was on its side. So I put it upright, then it fell head first. I noticed behind his buns, there was a pound. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it, there's no more. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> I said that we were working with Brona Gallery and Brona Gallery said, maybe it's a money box or something? <laughs> Which yeah. I thought, no, no, no. It's, it's like the, 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 the bear has had money behind its balls. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sorry. It, it, it seems funnier when my wife... <laughs> Could it be my children's antics aren't as interesting to other people? <laughs> no, it's the audience who are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it always is, it always is.
you, I read an interview that said uh, you were interested in German board games. Is that tr- is that true? Uh, German, no. D- the thing is, board games. Why can't did you say it if it's not true? Because I like <laughs> well, I like the w- I like that without the word German in front Why of it. Why did they have German in the interview? Why did it say German board Be- games? Possibly because it was long ago and it was at a time where the only board games you could get were in German. So what time was this? <laughs> About 10, 15 years ago. About Monopoly. Oh no, not fucking Monopoly. These are, <laughs> these are, these are good games. With what, what kind of board games do you play? At the moment, I play I play a card game called Netrunner, which is like a two-player game that I play in clubs okay. uh, with uh, nerds. Yeah. And uh, I play, um, you know, there's just some great great games out there. So they're kind of more complicated things than... Yeah, the problem with them is there's a, there's a little barrier you have to get through, which is explaining the rules to people, which people fucking hate. And so it's really hard to get a group together because everyone just hates that bit. Yeah. Because you go, no, no, you can't do that. You have, to, you have to move the red counter to there unless you want to do that. And then if you want to do that, you have to roll a six and then you can play that card. Or what do the cards mean? Well, okay. Uh, yeah, and it's just ugh, terrible. But the thing is, like everything else online, it's all made easier now by videos. You know, you can, you can watch a video. I just send a video to people and say, watch this. And, right. and they'll take you through it and then we can play. Right. It's good. It's good. It is good. I was playing. My, my daughter's got, who's 17 months old. Very cute. I could tell you a few stories about it. She, uh, she's, uh, she's got her first board game, which is it's a big dice with all different um, colours on it. And you roll them and then you pick up a card and you have to do what it says on the card. And I felt that was too... I was almost like, ah, oh, this is too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> As we started putting together, ah, oh, this looks difficult. But it was easy. You'd have to go red, uh, make a smiling face. <laughs> right. that, was easy. that was easy. It was actually easier than it looked. <laughs> My daughter didn't really like it. There's a beautiful one called Sh- Shadows in the, in the Forest, I think it is. Right. And it's, it is a German game. And you play with a tea light and you put it on... Um, you put it on the board and there's all these trees so it casts these shadows as the tea light moves along. Okay. And uh, the kids can move anywhere as long as they're within the shadow. But if the tea light catches them, if the light from the thing catch, catches them, uh, they, they're out. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's just a lovely nice. game. Yeah. And you still play? I played, last time I saw you, we were playing poker with each other. Yeah. A year yep. ago. That strange um, yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> we both got knocked out first. I think we were the best, but we both got knocked out. That's the, that's the problem with poker. Well, someone beat me, someone beat me by... Uh, draw, oh no, this is poker. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Let's go through the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> but are you still are you still playing a lot of poker? Or just no, I kind of I used to like playing online, and and it seems to have. Do- I used to like single player tournaments and yeah. or s- ten player tournaments, and and uh, I can't really do that anymore. I don't really know a good site that allows you to. D- is there a good one? I, I, don't, I haven't been playing very much online. I'll yeah, at all really. Yeah. Also, there were a few cheating stories that made you think. Oh, what, what are we doing? We're sitting at home thinking that no one's cheating. I mean, this is real money, and yeah. uh, of course they're cheating. You yeah. know, so. Yeah, the, bu- the bubble burst of it. We we did a pilot that was uh, which seemed a little bit too late in the day to take on a mm, maybe a yeah. poker TV show. Mm, maybe, you mm. know, it might come back. You never know. Got some free headphones. Did you get your headphones? Did they send you some headphones? Oh no, they didn't. Bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Could have sold them. Yeah. Yeah. I do like, but I still love poker. It's, no, it's, a, it's beautiful an amazing game. game. Yeah. But it's frustrating because you can be the best at it, as I am, and <laughs> never win. Yeah. <laughs> that can't be true. Um, all right, I'm going to, well, we're near, it's nearly time to let you go home and do some work, I think. Uh, but I will, uh, I'm going to ask you. Oh, what? ask me about Count Arthur. Oh, yes, I was going to ask you about, I will ask, what about, please old, watch it. What about old town <laughs> Arthur then? Which My friend, at the moment I get, I had a brilliant experience, someone getting off a, a train who met me and, you know, it was one of these ones that every time someone says, oh, you, you know, are you great now? And uh, I go, yeah, and, uh, and they go, I'm s- this guy went, I'm such a fan, I just love your stuff. And I go, oh, right, you know, um, well, he says, uh, and, and, and then they go, so what are you working on at the moment? And you suddenly realise there's something about the tone of the question that means I haven't watched one of your programmes since Father Ted. <laughs> uh, so you go, what are you working on at your moment? You know, after Dermot died, what did you do next? <laughs> and it's like, um, oh, well, you know, I'm doing the third series of Count Arthur Strong, you know. And this guy, and I said, uh, oh, you know, you should watch it. And this guy goes, is it any good? <laughs> Well, it's not my sort of thing, but... <laughs> sorry, sorry, I actually, that's a, a steal. I stole that joke from Simon... Um, Simon, think of it, Simon... Um, oh, yes. Black, okay. black, 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 Blackwell. Well. Uh, Simon said that they, someone did that to him once. They said, is that any good? <laughs> he 
<laughs> it's not my sort of thing. <laughs> but um, uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, it's um, it's kind of um, uh, an experiment in seeing if it is possible to write a mainstream half eight type type sitcom that isn't shite. Uh, yes. Yeah. And, and do you direct? You direct this as well? Do you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, you're you're doing it today. Yeah. I have to rewrite it tonight. Right. <laughs> And so you're working on one episode this week? I heard a story about you. I heard yeah. on... on uh, <laughs> it's not true. I heard Richard Bowden, my producer, oh, yes, yeah. who was your producer, he said you would not know a story at the start of the week and you would write the whole story in the week and film it on Friday night. Yeah, yeah. I, well, it was, it was something like Thursday to Thursday, but yeah, on, on uh, Time how, Gentleman, please. How are you still alive? I, it was difficult. Uh, but I was young. <laughs> I couldn't do it now, but it was a younger man and you right. know, it was... Um, it was weird because well, we we did the. I mean, I basically wrote a whole American Star series more or less on my own, uh, and we got nine. Amazing. We got nine more in the middle, so it was it was thirteen, and then another whatever it was, another nine added on. So That's I had to write insane. nine episodes in ten weeks. Why um, didn't you try and write six episodes in uh, twenty weeks? Because uh, we didn't have time. Because well, we spent like the first like, first script. I probably spent a month and a half on, mm. and then the second. You know, we would we worked on about six of them to begin with, and mm. we had we had a series of thirteen. And then, but literally, we were recording them, and then they said we want another nine, Jesus and Christ. you know, and then there's all these people who then get that nine weeks more work and all this other right. stuff, and so the product, you know, and we were getting paid really well for that. We got paid really good money for it, and so you know, and I was young, and I was kind of keen, and I write right, and you know, I think they were good. I think the ones I wrote in a week weren't any better or worse than the ones I wrote. Really? Yeah, I think they were. Cause I have to have a story. I have to have a really strong story. The week, the week. Um we start. I have to know at least what the story is. I, I can, well, I look kind of like discovering the stories I write. No, and that's, so a, that's I, insane. Well, <laughs> that's I, insane. I, well, it's, then you get to something that surprises you a bit, I think. Absolutely, but then you rewrite it when the, sto- when the thing that surprises you has appeared and you, and you plant the fucking thing at yeah. the start of the episode so that when it comes, it, it, it doesn't feel <laughs> random. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? I, mean, yeah, I, no, I, 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 I totally agree that there's a spontaneous... And, and, but I think there's, there's a kind of um, happy medium. Where yeah, definitely. You, I mean, writing one in a week, or writing, writing nine in ten weeks, as I did, is not a happy medium. Mm. I've worked very well to deadline, so it was, it, it was insane. I was, I was dating someone in the show as well, but I wasn't, so I was completely that in the show. Like a, a and, delic, <laughs> and, and it was literally all, so basically they would record them on the Thursday, I think. Um, I'd start working on the, you know, I'd finish the last one and then start on the next one on the Tuesday. By the Friday, I'd have something for them to read. Then I'd go away over the weekend and rewrite that, and the Monday I'd have something to read. Then I'd rewrite it on, and then on Tuesday they'd have Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to to get rehearse. Ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, we were rehearsing a bit on the Monday as the bits that we knew, but it worked quite because it because it was up and running a bit. The second series was really easy to write, and we didn't have any of those kind of problems. We had fifteen in the second series, uh, and because you got the characters all established, you know it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we were a bit more prepared, but I found it very easy to write them. But yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very proud of that series, but no one no one really ever saw it. So, yeah. but if you know, it paid for me to have a nice house in London. So yeah, there we yeah, go, yeah, yeah. or at least the beginning of a nice house in London. So it's uh, you know, it was it was I did like six years work in in two years, I would say. Right, right. Uh, and it was and it was well paid work, so it, was, it kind of set me up. It's funny, you can't really do you can't really. Do, I I've recently realised that I'm gonna have to for my health, I'm gonna have to stop doing studio sitcoms soon, because they're so. L- cumbersome and slow. I mean, they're like, like you rehearse them during the week, which is all fine, and then on the night you got three hours to do it. Yeah. And if you don't get it in the three hours, you're fucked. Yeah. You know. I mean, you can you can you can move a scene onto the next week, but that will create a domino effect, and you'll you'll won't be able to get something further down the line. And yeah. it's it's so stressful. I stand there. You know, and every time, you know, like like the first time there's a there's a boob, uh, um, the uh, the audience laughs, and you go, "Oh, it's so funny, you made a mistake." And the the like w- after one hour of that, you go, if he fucking does that again, I'm gonna fucking kill him. And stop laughing at him. Just stop laughing at him. You know, it's like that. It's crazy, <coughs> and I just don't think I, I I went through a period <coughs> because we had to write, you know far less than your output on, on time, gentlemen, please, but we had to write six episodes <coughs> in about two months. Yeah. And they were rewrites. Sorry, I better have some water. They were rewrites, so it was um, not too bad. Yeah. But I still got some kind of um, shoulder problem as a result, right. and yeah. now I have to see a fucking misuse every week. <laughs> right. You know, because the back 
muscles have seized up. The ones on the on the back aren't doing their job. And yeah, I mean, it's incredibly stressful. Um, mm. And, and it, it, comes on, it comes on when I'm watching the show. Yeah. When I'm watching it being made, I go like, at the end of the evening, I'm like the fucking phantom of the opera. <laughs> but after I wrote Time Gentleman, Please, it burnt me out, and then I've never really written anything again since then. But that's, so, that, that's why you should not never. Yeah. You know what I mean? I do, but you know, I think that's but that's the good thing about being young. You, I mean, I, you know, I'm sort of got a pilot, a, a script, pilot scripted now, and part of me is thinking, oh god. If, they make it, I've got to write six. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, you kind of go, oh. That's how Larry David apparently felt on Seinfeld. Right. Just, every series, he just never thought he could do it again. Yeah. But I kind of realised that, um, you know, one of the things I've always uh, lived by is that if you believe that the well of inspiration is very shallow, it will be. But if you believe it's deep, yeah. it, that will also be true. You know, and uh, as a result, I've been able to I have to say, rehearsing is now quite fun because I used to, on a Monday, uh, because you're comparing it to the one you've just done when you've done a week's work on it, yeah, yeah. on the Monday you read a script that you thought was in great shape and it's just shit. Yeah, yeah. Or you put it on its feet and you realise, oh, no one can move. He can't move over there because this thing is happening, so I have to rewrite this so he can move over to that part of the set yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. And it seems like a lot of work and it used to really upset me and I used to go home and I used to work till four in the morning and you know just just really upset thinking yeah. I have to fix this but then I realized recently that sorry this is very technical I hope it's interesting but I realized recently we have a whiteboard and anytime I come to a problem I write it on the board and then during the week we just cross them off one right. by one so yeah. on Tuesday there'll be nine on, on Wednesday there'll be you know five left yeah, yeah. and then there's usually one or two that, that you can leave till the night of the show, yeah. and there's something about the adrenaline and the excitement of doing the show that these jokes just pop out, yeah. you know? It's brilliant, it's such a nice, um, I'm yeah, really well, enjoying that's, it. But that's why I get from stand-up, I think, is that I, I now write my stand-up shows on stage, more or less. I go on with some ideas, but I improvise them, and that's exactly what happens. Yeah. The, 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 the stuff, that's why I find writing scripts hard now, because coming on stage, you're doing it for a few nights, you'll, you'll knock together a routine in a couple of weeks pretty easily, but also, that the power of that the the you know the deadline the very <laughs> real deadline of being on stage and having to say something yeah. means you come up with some with a phrase or or a joke that you would never you could sit down and try and write yeah yeah for weeks and you would never come up with it and you come up with it straight away so that inspiration I just I still get it from working I've I've, I've never been, you know the deadline I'm I'm terrified of missing deadlines and I hardly ever miss them but I, I have to be very close to it and then mm. I'll then mm. I'll suddenly be inspired and stuff will come out so it worked quite well for me that mm. time gentleman please thing but it was yeah it was. It was it was sort of tough, but it partly also we just you know I I, I for the first time I earned some money because we'd been doing the double act and that sort of paid off. That by the end of that ten years we were back even basically. Right. right. Uh, and then I suddenly had two years of really hard work where I earned more money than I needed to live off, mm, mm. and uh, and it sort of set me up. So it was, it, I think partly I got to the end of that and thought why have I worked so hard on stuff that nobody's ever heard of? Yeah. And so I'm not going to do you know. So I, I had a couple of years where I kind of just it wasn't really that I burnt out. It was just I was thinking, what's the point? Yeah, you know, and I've got some money now, so what's the point? So I bought a house that was too big for me, and then I had to carry on working. It's a brilliant, <laughs> it's a brilliant plan to pay for the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah I've got to yeah. keep paying the mortgage, haven't you? Anyway, look, we, I can see you've picked up your coat, and uh, it's, oh, no, uh, no. <laughs> I swear to God, that was just a coincidence. I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can pick up these little signals. <laughs> The years of doing this. It's been like, thank you so much for coming in without bloody Armando Yannucci ruining it all. <laughs> no worries. I'd, I'd, I'd gladly do it again, Rich, anytime oh, no, you no, want. Absolutely. I love it. It's we, really there's lots enjoyable. more to cover, so I'm sure we will have you back on again. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause. Stay in the Thank you. We'll be back next week with Sophie Hagen. Stick around. How do you like them sky potatoes?